Okay, good evening, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's business and economics series here at the BLSI. My name is Andreas Wasmuth, and I'm the convener for business and economics here at the BLSI. And it's uh, with great pleasure that I'm going to be announcing today's speaker uh, very shortly. But before I do, I just want to cover off a few um, nodes of etiquette before we start. On the basis of video and uh, um, sound, if for the for the presentation, if you could please all uh, take your camera off, and I'm looking at Elizabeth and I'm looking at Trevor, who very quickly went and uh, took their screens off, which is great. Um, that's really helpful because that will help us with bandwidth, and it will also help us uh, with Wi-Fi uh, not cutting out. So much appreciated. Well, I mean, it's it's my great pleasure to start then the introductions. Uh, and I'm really, really pleased that uh, Paul Dawson has uh, agreed to give tonight's talk on professional development and contextual intelligence. Uh, something, su a subject very, very close to my own heart and actually follows very seamlessly on for my talk last month in terms of what business needs to do differently and why business needs to change. And I've, I've had a peak preview of his slides and uh, I think you're in for an excellent uh, 45 minutes of uh, how professional development is developing, but also how it's changing uh, the culture in which we live. So I hope you look forward to that. I mean, Paul joined Bath Spa in uh, 2015. He's written two textbooks on the subjects of his expertise, which is professional development and business ethics. One is called uh, the personal and professional development for business students in 2015. And the other one is called business ethics in practice 2012. And that's no bad thing. But lots of people talk very much about business ethics and corporate social responsibility, and it never seems to leave the pages of the corporate report. And is you know, so that's one of the, the key things to focus on. So I think uh, we've got something in common. Uh, we both went to Leeds. Uh, uh, Paul got his uh, MBA at Leeds before coming to uh, Bath Spa. And he's also got several uh, uh, professional uh, memberships. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. He's a fellow of the Higher Education Academy. He's a fellow for the Research Center for Governance, Leadership and Global Responsibility. And he's also a member of the British Academy of Management. So a real expert in the field and I shall look forward to hearing all about it. Over to you, Paul. Thank you very much. Okay, can you hear me all right? Yes, fine. Okay, excellent. Can I just add to what Andreas has said that, uh, that we have not compared notes, which is interesting. So I, um, whatever Andreas uh, brought to you last, uh, last time um, is, uh, it, it interestingly accords, we, 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 we were saying, with, uh, with, with, with his own, own lecture, but we, we haven't compared notes. So we've arrived at some of the same conclusions independently, which is, which is really interesting. Okay. Just, uh, just continuing my introduction, um, as you can see, I'm a, a senior lecturer in business and management at uh, Bath Spa uh, University. And uh, these are those two, two books that Andreas was um, outlining. Um, the one on the left, uh, that's my most recent textbook um, entitled Personal and Professional Development for Business Students, and then uh, Business Ethics in Practice uh, was my former textbook um, published by the CIPD uh, in 2012 and was co-authored with Professor Simon Robinson. So starting off with definitions, because the title of our lecture is uh, Professional Development and Contextual uh, Intelligence. Um, so what is professional development? I'll just let you sort of read through um, what you can see on the slide there. I uh, teach professional development at uh, what are called levels four, five, and seven. So that's first year university students, second year university students, and, um, and master's level uh, students. And uh, this is the slide which I use at, at all, of those, all, of those, all of those levels. So it's about skills development, career development, personal development as it impinges on professional performance, and values consciousness. On to the next couple of slides. 
Um, I've taught uh, professional development in higher education for 20 years. And here's my framework of the subject matter covered in professional development modules. So I'll just give you a chance to just see the, the elements that are listed there. And then adding to that, there are these ones here, slide, slide number two. The subject matter um, of professional development applies to adults of all ages, um, undergraduates, and also uh, work-based learners. Um, in professional development modules, we tackle these subjects uh, head on. Um, but interestingly, you would find these subjects, let's just look back, uh, represented certainly in other business modules uh, and other modules across the, across the university. Uh, but they may be in other modules, slightly more what we would say embedded. And I guess a great example of that would be, would be something like sort of skills development. Uh, here's a slide showing the lecture and seminar content of my professional practice module uh, that I teach to um, first year business and management students. And um, I think it's the case that my colleague, uh, Polly Crockett Robertson, um, who, sh who is present also this evening and delivers uh, these lectures with me. So uh, I guess the thing to notice there is just to try and sort of flick through uh, what we cover in terms of the, the le lecture content. Okay. So that's, that gives you, I, I think, a window into what is, what is uh, professional development. Let's move on now to contextual um, intelligence. And uh, here I want to quote the uh, the, the eminent business historian, Professor Christopher McKenna of Oxford uh, University. Um, McKenna um, says, a sense of business history is important for business leaders to develop a contextual intelligence. That is a strong sense of the business environment they are navigating. Um, some of you will be familiar with what's known as the, the, the pestle analysis. That's where we, we look at uh, all matters political, economic, social, technological, environmental and legal. And that's part of having this, this contextual intelligence. But I want to say a little bit more, uh, I want to go a little bit more beyond uh, the pestle analysis uh, in the lecture this evening. Okay. Matthew Cutts argues that uh, contextual intelligence is about being able to accurately diagnose one's surroundings, one's context. Uh, interestingly adds that the context is from the Latin uh, context here, meaning to weave together. It's the term used to describe how a, how a tapestry was made. And sort of sticking with that analogy, I suppose I'd want to say that contextual um, intelligence is about being able to weave together the complex strands of reality into a coherent picture, um, a co coherent picture of the, of the contemporary and future context. Kurtz also argues that many contemporary leaders and managers are a little bit out of touch. Uh, that is that they, have, that, that they have poor contextual intelligence. Um, and that, furthermore, he argues that they're, they're in denial about, about change uh, and, and, and often entrenched in old behaviours. Uh, in relation to denying change, I suppose this is not to really take uh, seriously or take into account the, what, what are known as the, the VUCA forces, V-U-C-A, that is the forces of, of volatility, uncertainty, uh, complexity and, 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 and ambiguity. So, I, I, so conversely, to, 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 to argue with somebody with contextual intelligence would, would be coming to terms with all those things, those, those VUCA realities. Um, 
and would 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 want not to be entrenched in in old ways and behaviors okay so i've um, i've defined um professional developments and contextual intelligence and now i want to go on to introduce the the structure to this lecture which has these three parts uh, so look out for this slide which will um, which will slice up, as it were, the the, the 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 lecture and give you a give you a sort of a sense of where we're where we're up to. So part of contextual intelligence is firstly um, being able to, as I've put it here, theorize the contemporary world. So what do I mean by that? I'll come on to that in a second. I developed this sort of three level model to argue that when analyzing and interpreting the present and future, leaders and managers operate on three levels. So there are the three levels. And the idea is you, 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 rise, you rise up the peak, up the pyramid. At level one, leaders and managers have some awareness of the skills most needed for changing times and for the future. And this is quite a, um, quite a well-known listing uh, from the World Economic Forum of the top 20, uh, sorry, the, the, the top 10 skills, um, the 2020 top 10 skills um, that we should be looking to, to develop in, in, in today's uh, in today's workplace and um, and economy, and uh, what I tend to do with this slide when I show it to students is to sort of um, is to start at re revealing number ten and go down to sort of revealing the number one, and and that uh, and those ones at the very um, at the very the top as it were of uh, the top skills of um, complex problem solving, critical thinking, and creativity as well as people management are usually a little bit of a surprise uh, to, to, to people. So first of all, on, on, on level one, there is, there, is that, there is that skills analysis that, that needs to take place. Okay, on to the next level. At level two, leaders and managers commit to what we might say is technological analysis. And uh, James Avis, uh, the, the reference for, for James is, is, will be at the, um, on, on, on the references slide, highlights the divergence of techno-optimists and techno-pessimists. And that's a good question to ask, ask yourselves. Um, are you a, a techno-optimist techno or are you a techno-pessimist when you look into the future? Um, I, I wanted to make the additional point that um, this, 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 this broadly equals um, those people who, on the one hand, uh, see new opportunities with technological uh, advancement and development, and those who actually experience uh, technological development as, as, as equaling alienation and disruption. And I suppose that takes us into the realm of the fact that with technological advancement, there are what we might call techno winners and techno losers. And, and, and I guess conscious of that reality, we, we want to, don't we, sort of be very much uh, a part of, of those who, who, who could consider themselves techno winners and to try and, and uh, extend that territory of being techno winners to more and more people, so that there are not people who are who are who are losing out as a result of technology. Uh, in relation to technology, I wanted to add the point that uh, there's never been a time when human beings didn't live and work with tools, and that um, to to live and work with tools is part of our humanity. But Avis adds that it's important. Uh, to have a critical appreciation of, of technology and to also be aware that some technological development, some technologies could conceivably escape our control. And I suppose the things to be aware of there are things like AI and genetic engineering. 
And that, that is where, in view of that, that's where some of those sort of techno pessimists uh, come from, from being very guarded with respect to some of the dangers of technology. But of course, technology also offers uh, fantastic advancement and fantastic opportunities for many. Okay. On to level three. At level three, leaders and managers are able to, theor what I've put here, theorize the contemporary and emergent world. And uh, here I've just, um, I've included this quote. I think... We must have some conception of the ages of history and, and how we are transitioning from, from one age to another. I uh, wanted you to be able to read this quotation from, uh, from Parker. And uh, he highlights it's not a straightforward or easy thing to uh, understand the significance of the age that one is actually living in. Uh, as uh, Techno and Tomasi put it, uh, if all we know is the inside of a cave, then we cannot even form the concept of a cave. And I guess the thing I wanted to really highlight in this quote from Parker um, is, uh, is that sentence where it says that, um, it, that, that its power can pass unnoticed, the, the, the age that we're living in, it can pass unnoticed since its agenda and its vocabulary define uh, what will, will be regarded as normal. Okay, so it's, it's normal life uh, for so many of us, and hence we don't see it uh, critically and in and and in relief. Uh, here's one of my <laughs> favourite slides this evening, um, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm always banging on about these things. And uh, I've spent the last ten years, I suppose, uh, trying to map where we're up to uh, historically and and philosophically. Uh, and when you look at all these terms, many of which you, 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 you'll be very familiar with, um, to, 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 to look at these matters and to study them uh, and to debate them is, is what has been referred to as the paradigm wars. Uh, and so how do we interpret this slide? Well, very broadly, we are transitioning, aren't we, from modernity to something else. That's what this slide suggests. And um, perhaps that something else is only a changing way of being modern. So we're transitioning from modernity to, some would argue, a state of post-modernity. Some would say that we've come out of that and that we're into post-post-modernity. Uh, my favourite term is really um, is that we, we are going in the direction of late modernity. Um, and then there is also the alternative of Bauman's, which describes where, where we're up to as, as liquid modernity. And the one which we probably know we're, we're hearing the most, and I, I guess it is a, an expression of late modernity, this idea that we are morphing into the age of sustainability. Uh, and that is, that is uh, an exciting thing. Okay. So it's important for students, it's important for us all, it's important for, for leaders and managers to, to, to be able to have a, have a sense of, of, of what is going on historically and, and philosophically and, uh, and, to, and, and, to, and to note the journey that we're all participating in. Here's uh, some content from my uh, most recent uh, textbook, which... Uh, highlights the hallmarks of uh, what I've described as late modern turbulence. Um, perhaps you, you recognize in, in my list here, things that we're experiencing every day. That's, that, that's all of us, all hallmarks of late modern turbulence. So uh, sadly, a little bit more distress, um, recurrent transitions, frequent dis, um, dislocations, 
uh, a disrupted sense of self, uh, demand for us to be flexible, and um, an emphasis on self-navigation. Can I say that I see these things writ large in my, uh, in my uh, fabulous undergraduates, who in a strange way caricature what's going on in wider uh, society? So they are, they, they, they are ever um, aware of, of, of what I have listed here. Okay, right, let's move on. I selected this image to convey uh, two topical aspects of the contemporary and, uh, and it seems coming ages. Okay, so just have a, have a little bit of a look at, uh, at that image. Uh, one is the growing sense and significance of our uh, connectedness. And uh, speaking to Andreas before the lecture, I think that was that was something which he highlighted highlighted in his uh, in his talk where he spoke about why why business must change. Um, in that in that connectedness, we could describe it as a as a, as a, as a kind of new pantheism, and that's the idea that that all things are connected and we're more and more aware of how we're connected to all things. Uh, and of course, meaning is found in our con connections and particularly in those connections that we feel most associated with uh, or that, we, that we, we, most, we, most, we most sort of celebrate our connection with, with, with certain things. Okay, so that's... That's the first thing I wanted to mention. Then this, 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 this second uh, sense of the of the contemporary and emerging world uh, is uh, the emerging ethical imperative of what I've uh, summarised as letting be. So uh, that's letting something be the way it is in itself, and uh, I guess you can see that in our attitudes. Uh, more and more to say, for instance, the animal world, there is a, a greater emphasis now on, on, on letting, letting um, um, animals be uh, what, they, what, what they want to be in their natural, in their natural habitat, habitat. And this, this attitude of letting something be the way it is in itself contrasts sharply uh, or even diametrically to the, to the, to the modern domination and control of things. Uh, so that's a profound change in, 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 in late modernity. Uh, and Vicenus uh, speaks of letting all things be the way they are in themselves by not subjecting them forcefully to our subjective order. Okay. And uh, I, I, I guess that causes me to ask the question, uh, is this our attitude to difference and diversity uh, variety and 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 other uh, that we don't subject um, uh, people and things of, of difference uh, to to our own sub subjective order. Okay, right. Moving on to the uh, the, the second section at Bath Spa, we teach our business and management students the different types and styles of a leadership. Uh, and uh, to do business and management uh, at Baspa or to do that at any university is, is, is a training for management and leadership. Uh, but we're highlighting that to accord with the need for contextual intelligence, we need to teach a way of being more dialogic uh, as leaders and managers. And this is something I'm uh, really uh, enjoying uh, developing as uh, as, 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 as teaching material with, uh, with my colleagues. Here's a quote from, uh, from George, who we know well, George Alagaya. Um, with dialogic leadership, there is an emphasis on connecting. And, um, and as George highlights, this is a more advanced capability than even uh, great communication. This uh, next slide, um, shows uh, rich content on dialogue that can be found in Hermann's and Geyser. 
um, and uh, control, so essential to dialogue is a regard for alterity, as they state here. And that is the state of being other or different. Um, and so, so dialogue is, 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 is having this regard for alterity in others, uh, but as, as our authors here recognize, also having this having a regard for alterity in ourselves. And if we if we have that regard for alterity, uh, this will this will uh, contribute to the welfare uh, of ourselves and, and wider society. OK, right on to the next slide, which is probably a little bit more straightforward and accessible. So here I summarize uh, dialogue, dialogic content. Uh, it's about finding one's own voice, uh, which is an exciting uh, an exciting journey and, and, and thing to do developmentally. It's about active and deep listening. Uh, that's really listening out to what um, what other people are saying, uh, to what you are hearing in, 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 in wider society. And thirdly, it's about accepting plurality in oneself and other. We, we are not um, unitary beings. We're not one thing. We are we are many things, um, and as we as we as we celebrate our humanity, um, and celebrate uh, humanity in general, it, it, it's about really understanding and comprehending and embracing uh, plurality. Okay. So, what is the dialogic leader? Well, this is leadership which essentially has the value and practice of dialogue uh, at its core. And that's a leadership style that fits with the late modern uh, about now and the age which is emerging. I've got a very exciting slide to show you next, which is some of the work which I have done with um, our MBA students on dialogic leadership. And this is a little bit of a uh, little bit of action research, if you like, just just have a have a quick read through the points that uh, my MBA students came up with uh, when they really sort of embrace this this notion of of the dialogic leader. So wanting to connect as well as communicate, happy to happy to sit with us uh, uh, rather than always be um, disappearing um, as leaders. Um, don't view communication as just being tran a transactional thing. This 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 next point is is huge. Uh, seek uh, to connect with all the generations. So that is a hallmark of the dialogic leader, not just being, uh, I suppose, um, uh, really in touch with with one or two generations, either the younger generations, the older generations, but seeking really to connect with all the generations, much, much needed in our society. Um, and and the, the, this next point is very, very profound, that the dialogic leader has something to bring that alleviates anxiety. If you want to look in a little bit more detail at dialogic leadership, uh, I'd recommend also that you are aware of Simon Weston's eco-leader. I'm not going to go into much detail here, uh, but there are a couple of slides about how uh, Western, um, um, how he contributes this idea of, 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 of a dialogic leader and a dialogic understanding. So leadership that adapts to and harnesses the power of today's network, network society. I guess an important point to, to make in relation to, to, to Western's thinking is that he, 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 he discovers two versions of the, the so-called eco-leader. Um, there is this, the type of eco-leader that has got to grips with network society and, uh, and, 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 and how that could advantage them and their organizations commercially. So it, it's, just, it's just an insight into the way the, way the world is, is moving and, 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 and it's exploited commercially. And then, and then this additional point uh, that 
actually it can also have an, an ethical version that uh, to to comprehend how how society is connected and networked has obvious ethical implications. Okay, I wanted to highlight that uh, to be a dialogic leader is to be the leader that listens. And here I've got, I've got a book I can recommend by Jim McNamara, um, which is um, his book, Organizational Listening, The Missing Essential in uh, Public Communication. Um, Jim asks the question, uh, what if we're not good at, not that good at listening? So uh, perhaps a lot of leaders do think that they are good listeners when in actual fact, they're not that good, uh, good, at, good at listening. And, uh, and he proposes what he calls an architecture of listening in our organizations. Here's, the, here's that architecture uh, that might exist in, in our uh, organizations, which is, which is very dialogic, where there is time for listening to one another, where, where there are resources devoted to, to listening, where there are practices of listening, a culture of listening, uh, where listening is reflected in our structures and reflected in our policies. Okay. Uh, so uh, are you uh, in an organization that looks like that, either, either um, working there or in education there? That is uh, a dialogic type of uh, organizational uh, reality we, we must move toward. Right, on to the final section, which, uh, which I've called living and working with conceptual puzzlement and other characteristics of the new age. Um, and, and in this section, I'll argue that, profes that uh, professionally uh, developing leaders and managers with contextual intelligence is bound up with coming to terms with a number of characteristics of the new age. So let's have a look at the first of those new, uh, those characteristics of the new age. There is a blurring of boundaries of all kinds. Um, we can probably remember the former world where there was a sense of, of um, people who were in and people who were left out. And it's important to say that some of those old walls are coming down um, where, uh, where, where the, the, those, those, those who are on the inside uh, is, is, are changing from, from those who used to occupy the inside as distinct from uh, being outsiders. OK, so you can probably hear in what I'm saying this. Uh, it's a good job. Some of those those old walls are indeed coming down. Um, stakeholders have, have more and more significance. And, and weirdly, in organisations, they were once, they're kind of once treated as, as, as effectively outsiders, uh, whereas very much they need to be regarded now as, as insiders. And I guess the, the, the significant point there is that there are more and more stakeholders uh, to take into account. Uh, in, in, in every organization. Uh, I suppose in relation to the blurring of boundaries, globalization is continuing to do its work here. So uh, as globalization continues, that does actually break down boundaries of all kinds. So that is happening. And then there is the breakdown of a duality between uh, the, the public and, and, and private spheres. So people very used to at one time very much have 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 a, have a public life and a private life, and now that duality is is interestingly uh, breaking down. I wanted to make the point that uh, diversity uh, is is cool, and um, and particularly the the younger generations capture this uh, in in, uh, in a very visionary way. Uh, it's cool to be diverse, and unitary ways of being and associating are not very cool, are they? <laughs> okay. Um, and finally, in, in relation to the blurring of uh, boundaries of all kinds, uh, this reflects the fact that more and more of us are gaining access to information uh, in, in the so-called information age. So there's a, there, is, there is more information than we know really what to do with it. 
there's a proliferation of in information and this is again sort of breaking down boundaries okay on to the uh, second point um it's there is a, a, a now a now emphasis with less emphasis on the past and on the long-term future so there isn't almost the time sadly to look at the, into the past or or even to to, to be exercised with with with, with the long-term future uh, because we're, we're all on really to get our heads around what is happening in the now um, and i suppose this goes with the emphasis on having experiences and 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 sharing those experiences on on social media as I, as i guess i wanted to convey uh, in in the slide that you're looking at so the the big now calls for complex problem solving uh, which um we, we remember was identified as the number one skill uh, by the world economic forum for 2020 there's so much to process that's going on in the present so that's the point i wanted to make there on to my third point everyone including managers and leaders are grappling to come to terms with complex reality um, everything is contingent and subject to change nevertheless the role of leadership is to recognize and manage the avoidances and postponements that accompany uh, engagement okay so so good leadership i suppose um there is authenticity about the authenticity about the fact that we are grappling with complex reality uh, uh good leaders can come can 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 come clean about that but also help us to to navigate um the the, the, the stickiness that we experience in 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 moving forward um uh and 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 coming to terms with 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 complex reality and then this this final slide um is um is about the alternative organization and Eskela um discusses the significance of uh alternative organizations that operate in a contrasting way to traditional organizations so i guess over time we might observe that 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 um uh, tr tr traditional organizations are, are are being replaced by more alternative organizations in different economic spheres and um these these alternative organizations are pursuing aims like uh, mutual support uh, sustainable development which is obviously um an, an, an exciting aspect of being a uh, an alternative organization uh, the notion of self-management uh, self-expression and bringing change bringing a change in society the alternative organization is also a learning organization and uh, and will sort of abide with this this need if you like to learn more and and faster uh, which are the things which uh, are hallmarks of of a learning organization so to conclude here's my uh, list of references which you can study at your leisure um, so hopefully i've provided a window on professional development in the 21st century and the growing significance of contextual intelligence so this should firstly involve going beyond skills analysis and technological analysis uh, to us being able to theorize the contemporary world okay that's the first point you'll remember then on to the second point future leaders and managers will need to be more dialogic in their approach and expertise uh, and that will involve uh, knowing themselves and be more authentic there uh, it will all be about learning through listening to others 
uh, listening to, 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 to diversity and what's going on in, in the wider world and society and, and being more comfortable with, um, with, with, with alterity as I expressed it. And then thirdly, uh, modernity and the controlling approach of modernity has tell, taken a hell of a shaking uh, in recent years. Okay. But, and, and I think in relation to that, I wanted to make the point that boundaries will continue to become more blurred, more boundaries will be, um, will be, will be broken down. Um, the now will, I think, continue to, to dominate in this information age where we've got to get to grips with so many things in, in, in the present. Uh, we have to be more comfortable with change and even and even and even puzzlement and uh, and excitingly alternative organizations will emerge i guess uh, so many of us want to be a part of uh, uh, to be employed by uh, and to be a part of alternative organizations uh, rather than locked into uh, traditional organizations which are behind the times Okay, that's uh, that. That's 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 what I wanted to say, and I'm I'm very happy to uh, to uh, go into the questions and answers section. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul. That was very good. Um, um, we're now going to right. show open to the audience, so you can now you can now actually uh, unmute. And you can go and uh, actually show your video. We're recording this, so if you don't want to be on the video after this on the YouTube channel in four weeks' time, obviously don't don't uh, show your video. But otherwise, if you could all unmute now, I can uh, ask you all to unmute. That would be very helpful. And then we can uh, give uh, Paul a round of applause for his exposition on professional development. And uh, we're now getting into the Q and A session. So once again, Paul, thank you very much for for your lecture. Much appreciated. And we're now, now getting to, to the nub of the whole thing, which is actually about the questions that all of this raises, because clearly uh, what you are uh, highlighting in terms of professional development is, is a very different way to how most of us would have experienced professional development in the past, how we would have been taught it and uh, you know, various uh, managerial models. So I should look forward to quite an animated Q and A session. So, who would like to go first? We've also got things in the uh, in the old chat room, so I can ask questions there. But uh, let's start in the room, so to speak, first. Who wants to go first? Oh, silence! Oh no, Ben is there. Ben. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, thank you, Paul, for your fascinating uh, talk. Overall, I, I guess I, I've just jumped in because I, I was particularly caught, actually, by one of your. Um, earlier comments uh, on the concept of letting be, which I, which I found uh, very interesting, particularly from a from a kind of ecological perspective, um, because I wondered if uh, <laughs> I wondered if it was part of uh, human nature to always be struggling with the concept of letting be, both in personal terms and in wider relationships to those beyond us. Um, so, in a sense, whether whether let so letting be, in one sense, is part of. Um, protecting but at the same time part of celebrating but I, I guess I was interested in your takes a little bit more on uh, or a little bit if you have an opportunity or, on kind of how does letting be sit with particularly I mean I guess in modernity the the drive towards constant change constant innovation which clearly is is problematic there but even in personal terms uh, the letting be seems to be a countervailing force to your personal development <laughs> direction if I can say that Uh, Paul, you're still on mute. You need to unmute yourself, Paul. There you go. Thank you, Ben. I've, I'm glad you've asked me about uh, letting be, and uh, and uh, it's. Uh, I guess this, the the saying in and of itself reminds me a little bit of the uh, of the Beatles song. <laughs> okay, let it be. Um, and uh, and I, I I agree with you about your point that it, it's um, it to a degree is counterintuitive. Um, that uh, uh, we um, we like patterns, uh, we like security, 
Uh, we like things that 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 we know. Um, but uh, for any of us who have, for, for people who have experienced um, lots of change, new things, uh, we can we can capture the fact that uh, there is an adventure to um, discovering people who are not like us, uh, to to being subject to, um, uh, to, to to logic and thinking, which which is which is which is not 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 our own. Uh, to to learn to learn through listening. Um, this is indeed is this this more dialogic approach which I'm which uh, which I've um, uh, which I've emphasised. Um, I guess that 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 concept of of letting be. I, I, I'd come back to that that idea of um, that it's it's a slightly sort of more pantheistic sort of outlook and philosophy. Uh, the idea that um, the idea that we've got to come into a knowledge that we are more profoundly connected to other people and other things than we first thought, um, or 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 how or how we view things when we were when we were growing up, uh, and that part of part of maturity and and the and the journey of life is to actually understand. That uh, we that that it's that that learning is about coming to terms with the fact that um, coming to terms with the fact that that uh, um, of 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 other and 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 other. Oh, I think uh, Paul will be back any second. I think this has happened before, where he disappears for a couple of seconds and he's back. We just we were just about to get the complete answer there. <laughs> you were, but you have to wait then. <laughs> You're back, Paul. Sorry, you're, you're back. You, know, you, fro you froze for a couple of seconds, but you're oh, back. Now. Do you, can, you, can we get the last twenty seconds again? Sorry, sorry, Andrew. Yeah, because um, we missed that. We missed oh, it. You, you got cut off. <laughs> I, I think I would argue it is the direction in which we are going philosophically. Hmm. I think there is a, a wider recognition that we've got to we've got to let others be. Um, and other things be what they what what they want to be. But interestingly, uh, th th there is a bit of a, a conflict going on. Uh, there is a battle going on between those who would embrace plurality and and those who would who would uh, would would revert to sort of unit unitary conceptions of, of being uh, politically and 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 and, and, other and otherwise. Um, so. Uh, what's going to be the outcome of the battle? We do not know, uh, but I, I think that more and more we are moving in the direction of embracing, particularly the younger generations, and this will have an outworking uh, that there is um, that there is this, this this need to recognise greater plurality. Yeah. Now, I, I I also like the concept of let it be because it reminded me of a very uh, Chinese philosophy, Taoism, which is all about Wu Wei and uh, action in inaction. And I think that's a really interesting topic, isn't it, Paul? Because, uh, you know, the leader in the in the Western world is seen as somebody who can direct and control, yes. whereas actually, uh, you know, modern leadership is more about actually letting be, uh, letting people actually do what they need to deliver rather than to interject all the time. You know, leadership to some extent, it's about providing guiding principles and guiding constraints rather than telling people exactly what they have to do every minute of the day. So very interesting. Sorry, Elizabeth, I've been rattling on. Elizabeth, uh, over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd like to riff on the letting be kind of theme as well, actually, a couple of the other themes that you brought up. So I completely get where you're coming from, that we are increasingly wanting to let the ecological kind of system be and that's fantastic but I think that socially we're not doing the same thing and I think that at the moment broadly speaking in the sort of private sector especially we have competence hierarchies and that they're being mistaken for kind of oppressive dominance hierarchies which is leading us to pursue affirmative action and people think, as you said, that diversity is cool, but it's very limited diversity of like race and gender. 
um, and actually diversity of thought, diversity of political opinion is being destroyed. And, you know, actually the diversity of political opinion, for example, is very important for business. So if you look at, you know, James Damore's Google memo, he suggested that it's good to have sort of conservatives in your business because they maintain order and they're very conscientious and it's good to have your liberals and your left-wingers in an organization because they drive innovation and change and have these wacky ideas that might just be the next big thing um, and I think we're losing that so if you've got any thoughts on that idea. Well I like your point Elizabeth I, 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 uh, that there are vested interests aren't there and um, and those those people with um, with interests in this in the system remaining as it as it as it has been, um, um, that uh, that they're, that they're not going to give up the, their their power and their influence easily. Uh, I think I would be arguing that there that there is. A, a, a political process to happen there um, and that I think politically uh, I mean who knows where we will be in five or ten years but I think things are are shifting significantly um, and, and again we come to that sort of that concept of the of embattlement uh, how it's who's going to win how it's going to play out we we, we 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 just we just we just can't predict I mean, I, I think I would, uh, sorry, I've forgotten your name from Bath Spa, our host. Oh, I'm Andreas, I'm not from Bath Spa. Andreas, Spar, so I'm not. sorry, sorry, I do apologise. Okay. You mentioned Taoism and they have the idea of chaos and order. And I think that sort of political and intellectual, moral, philosophical diversity brings a balance of chaos and order to an organisation which is being um, systematically destroyed um, by, you know, if you look at, say, Silicon Valley, you're very hard pushed to find um, uh, an explicit conservative there, anyone who will admit that they're a conservative. And I think that that's a problem. It's the same in the university sector. Yeah, and I, I, I liked your point about sort of um, um, left wingers and those and, and centrists and, 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 and conservatives. Uh, Sort of, um, sort of coming together. I think. Yeah. I think. I think a dialogic approach is not to regard somebody who has um, a, a, a political, a con contrasting political view to oneself as uh, as, as, as stupid. <laughs> Helps or evil. Yeah, yeah or evil. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and 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 we can we can see this at work in politics as it stands at the moment, both in the United States and and, and in the United Kingdom. And um, and I guess a university does teach us um, to to have a higher regard for political diversity, uh, which often reflects people's backgrounds and their cultural backgrounds. And there is a massive need in all our contemporary organisations to, um, to, to, to not just in a unitary sort of way uh, judge people according to their politics, but to, 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 but to get beyond that into the, the realm of alterity, as I said, and, and to appreciate that actually there's a lot more to everybody mm. than what is their political tradition or persuasion. Uh, uh, there is there is a massive need for more respect and more tolerance, and I don't think those things will 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 come will come easy uh, in 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 this in this present climate. No, well, I think I, I totally agree with you, Paul. I mean, unfortunately, you know, we come to any business situation with our own prejudices. You know, whether they're political, whether they whatever they are, and really, we should do better if we could park those prejudices at the door and actually approach things with an open mind when we are in different business situations. I've got Antonio uh, raising a hand electronically on Zoom, which is good. Antonio. Yes. Um, uh, sorry, let me just come uh, on the camera. OK, brilliant. Thank you. Antonio. Thank you very much. Uh, um, thanks, Paul, for the lecture. That was 
very interesting and, and, and definitely good food for thought. I want to ask um, a question about the ethical implications of all this, because, uh, well, you written about business ethics. Um, and modernity, as we know it, has provided kind of the, the, the ethical guidance and standards for, for the last uh, 250 years, right? Uh, our notions of what's right or, or wrong. And, and I don't know, sometimes I'm concerned that if we move away from that, uh, whether what, what's, what's going to replace that in terms of, of, of ethics. So yeah, that, that was basically my question. What, what the, ethical, the ethical implications are of all this uh, change from, from our idea of modernity to whatever is coming uh, next. Yeah, just a couple of things, a couple of things to respond to uh, there. Um, I suppose if we have this, this. How is the modernity? Sorry. Okay, sorry. I, um, my 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 first point would be that um, as we sort of have this have this sense that we are connected to to everybody and all things. Um, that 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 should um, have an outworking in terms of us having more respect for um, for other um, and and, uh, and 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 a sense that we 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 need we need um, everyone else we need everything else um, and, and that's 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 that is one sort of ethical implication of. Of our sense of connectedness, um, a, a, a second aspect to, 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 to what you said is that ethics are not just about the about about what is right and, and what is wrong, but ethics is also about the search for the good life, and I think that that many of us uh, are, are aspiring, more and more of us aspiring, um, out of a sense of concern and even anxiety, looking at the the state of the of the contemporary world and looking into the world of the future, particularly ecologically, to to to, to search uh, for the good life. And obviously, this will this will involve uh, structural change. Uh, it, it, it has to. We can't uh, we can't hang on to the just the structures of, of of yesteryear because they're not really fit for purpose in in in, in the new age. So. Uh, we've got to change, change structures, change structures in wider society, change structures in 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 in, organ, in, in old, our organisations, um, change change ourselves, <laughs> um, and 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 um, I think one of the m most profound ways to change is to is to recognise how we how we need one another, um, and and indeed we need all things that are, that that. Are, that are found uh, present in, 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 in the world as we find it. Yeah, okay, thank you for that. Trevor, you've been indicating for a while. Trevor, over to you. No, <laughs> not so far. Uh, Paul, thank you very much. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, I'd like to ask a very practical uh, question. When we look at that 2020 top 10 uh, list of skills that you, you had, yeah. uh, I don't think anyone would, would disagree that that's an important set of skills that have been known for quite a long time. But one of the criticisms of business schools has always been that people know a lot about the theories and what they should do, but they're lacking in, in the real practical skills. Uh, I'm just interested to know what you do at Bath about really ensuring that people who graduate go out with those skills, the skills to basically communicate, which means making presentations, which means taking part in meetings, which means listening, which you which you, you mentioned there. Those are real practical skills that not many people have naturally, and they need to get those skills in order to put into practice all the good things that you've been talking about. What do you do at Bath about those things? That's a, that is a great question, Trevor. I suppose it's about, um, what I call process learning. So to become more and more conscious as, 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 as teachers about how we are, how we're delivering the development of these skills in our learning um, and in our pedagogic um, 
uh, approaches. Um, I think that I have always resisted this sort of instrumental how to approach, so how to give a better presentation, and that the, the way to actually um, to become a better pre um, presenter is to actually get along with presenting. So I, I think um, uh, at Bath Spa, as, as, as I'm sure is the case at, at every university up and down the land, there is, um, a, a, as teachers designing learning, we are, we're very conscious that, that the way really to, for us to grow in these skills is through, is, through, is through process learning. So designing our learning so that it involves um, developing creativity or expressing creativity uh, so that our discussions are centered in critical thinking uh, so that we do do uh, in, in, um, in our assessments and our, in our class exercises, uh, complex problem solving. Uh, I think, therefore, it's it's about resisting this idea that uh, of of not approaching these this skills development instrumentally and abandoning the whole the whole how to thing and 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 really recognizing that whatever subject that we are studying, um, there is massive value in terms of not only the not only the subject matter, but uh, in terms of the the. The way in which we learn is, is, is centered in skills development, and I and I and I guess every 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 uh, lecture is is minded about how uh, when they when they're delivering whatever it is from economics to to art and design how these how these um, how these skills can be developed. Yeah, it reminds me. Of when... Go on, go on, Trevor. I just wanted to come back, but do the students, for example, get a chance to practice those skills? I mean, to, 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 to practice taking part in the meeting, or to practice uh, making presentations and getting feedback so that they really do leave with uh, uh, some skills which they can then develop from that, but so that at least some knowledge of what they should be trying to do in communicating. What I'd argue there, um, Trevor, is that Yes, I, I think we are seeing that at Baspa. I'm not claiming anything for Baspa, which I don't think is going on at the universities. Um, but I, I think there's a, rec a big recognition that we've got to uh, we've got to make our teaching more participative. And 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 as we involve the learners more, as we involve the students more, which they will, uh, on the one hand. Um, be very self-conscious of participating but on the other hand naturally want more and more to in a democratic way to participate in 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 learning that we have to we have to we have to move toward that um we have to go with that and we have to we have to go through the pain barrier of students who who are, who are very self-conscious and and have, uh, may have been used to sort of being um, mm -hmm. being taught at and, and, and instead um, involving them in the learning, honoring them in the learning and, and, and getting, getting to hear their getting to hear their voice. I think this is a challenge for, for, for every uh, education institute, but it's also a challenge uh, for, for every lecturer to, to ask themselves you know what is their teaching style and what is what is what is the philosophy that that, uh, that sort of um, underlies, their their approach and, and are they willing and are they willing to shift? Um, are they willing to shift to a more participative way of of education, mm -hmm. even though it's not easy? Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Any question? We've got quite a few in the um, in the chat rooms, comments and observations. So if people don't have more questions, I can just catch up on a couple of those. Uh, Deborah, uh, who I can see is on the call. She says. Uh, COVID has probably accelerated this latest transition to the new age. It's either sustainability or the end of days. Mm. Laugh out loud. <laughs> so, so which which direction are you heading, Paul? Uh, is it is it towards sustainability or are we all in desperate trouble? Well, I think there are massive dangers in uh, in, in the world and in and in wider society and things things. 
historically it shows us that things do go belly up and things go terribly wrong. And God forbid that that, that will happen. Um, so there are apocalyptic scenarios for, for all sorts of communities and all sorts of nations and, and peoples. And we've, and we've seen that, we've seen that historically. Um, but I, I really like Deborah's question. And, and I think what she's sort of teasing out is that, that we've really got to, we've really got to capture a vision for, um, for sustainability, for this uh, letting be and getting along with uh, one another, finding room really for for one another, because in in, in the present setup there 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 isn't room for for many for many people, uh, for many communities, and um, and for and for plant and animal life. Right. So uh, I think it's in the balance, um, and and but but. Uh, but, 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 but I think politicians and other leaders will come along that will cast um, an ecological vision, a, a vision for sustainability. And I, I think that has the potential to be, to be caught and to change the face of how we, we operate in the world and, and in indeed in business. Okay, thank you. Another one that was in the chat room is, is really one that I prompted and is that you talked about turbulence and the question was, is whether we are in a evolutionary or revolutionary stage of turbulence at the moment. And uh, Deborah seems to be thinking revolutionary and Elizabeth is going one step further saying, why not both at the same time? So uh, where, where do you, where are we there in your opinion, Paul? Well, I, I think first of all, to I think we can all agree that we, that, 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 that there, is inter, there is turbulence there. So it's therefore an, a question of how we interpret the the turbulence, because the turbulence can't be uh, can't be denied. Um, yeah, I think there is something of, of I think there is something of, of, of revolution in the air, and uh, what we've got to remember is that uh, uh, revolution, as it as it takes hold, is is not a comfortable process for 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 many people. Uh, there are winners and losers of of, <laughs> of every of, of, of every revolution, but I, I think um, I think um, I think revolution is in the winds. Uh, so, but we 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 try to go forward without going into a state of of of, of, of chaos. Um, and um, but I think that I think I I, I would recognise that that that. that that revolution of one shape or other does lie ahead. Yeah. Okay. So you 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 you're focusing more on the evolutionary future rather than a sort of peaceful, calm, collected evolutionary path to something new. No, I think so. I think, as I said earlier, you, you probably heard it loud and clear that I said that there are vested interests and yeah. and people people don't give up people don't give up their power easily. So power has to either be challenged or. Or, 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 or die out or die out um, uh, and in that way change but uh, but but I think we are in for a I think we are in for a bumpy path um, in, in the right. future. Well surely somebody must be commenting on that yes Andy Morley. <laughs> um, well, talking about bumpy paths um, and, and we had reference to some of our wonderful philosophies from from the Far East and being someone that spent a good percentage of their life in the Far East, one of the big concerns I have is what um, what China may be doing in the not too distant future. And from a leadership point of view, um, I'd I'd love to have the opportunity to sort of have a face to face with Xi Jinping, and and um, be able to have a, a sort of sensible discussion about uh, some of the things you're saying, which runs so contrary to, to sort of the, the current thinking. And as far as they would come back to us, I think, and say that if we sort of went ahead with some of the wonderful things that you're talking about, it would result in complete chaos. Um, and I, I was just sort of thinking about my hypothetical conversation there and how I would come up or want um, some nice strong evidence to sort of uh, be putting forward to say that in fact, um, 
the majority or the society, um, even the perhaps less educated corners of China aren't going to fall apart. Perhaps the, the, the power sort of um, structure is going to change dramatically, but yeah, the, this, uh, I think that's quite an interesting question to be pondering. Right. Over to you, Paul. What about China? Yeah, um, I, I think I like Andy's point. Uh, meanwhile, uh, China is growing in significance in the world, and um, and uh, part of uh, part of America's struggle, I think, is is the recognition that uh, over time uh, China is just growing in, in significance and and will will continue to to exercise more and more influence. Uh, in in the world, and and uh, and then how will the world look when um, when the when the top dog is is not a is not a liberal power uh, is not a liberal power with with the with the kind of kind of liberal philosophy that I've been sort of espousing uh, this evening, because at, at the bottom I think of what I've been espousing is something which is 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 about is about toleration. Um, is, is, is about embracing plurality uh, and that, that is a very that is a very markedly liberal philosophy which uh, which uh, what I'm just saying is that that is not going to be shared by by other other major cultures and powers uh, in the world who will view things very differently um, and uh, and so what actually happens will reflect how the uh, I suppose the the, 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 the the new powers operate in the global world. So, so how will the world change when America is no longer the top dog, uh, when Europe has less significance globally, uh, when China continues to emerge? And meanwhile, meanwhile, the great historical culture uh, and power of Russia <laughs> goes on too. Uh, so, so, so uh, back to my vested interests point. Nobody just stands by and uh, and, and allows uh, an easy switch of influence and power. Um, power is hung on to, interests are hung on to. So, how how are these things going to play out uh, in the future? That's uh, it, it. Does it does seem to it does seem to suggest a rocky road? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Paul. Polly, you've got a, a question. You're raising your hand. You just need to unmute yourself first. Great. Yeah, um, I suppose. Hi, Paul. Um, thank hey, you so Colin. much. I really enjoyed that. And, and my head is absolutely full of things that I would just love to say if we had another three hours. Um, but I suppose in a direct response to what you're saying, um, I, I suppose my question then is about uh, the difference between power and leadership. Mm. And I think there's 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 something that we need to keep reminding ourselves uh, uh, about that as far as, you know, we can think about the kind of scary things that happen under power and maybe the valuable and good things that can happen under leadership and about bringing leadership back to the sort of smaller scale in our communities um, and the people that we work with in order to make a better power from that. So it's kind of about scaling it back down again. And I just wondered what your response was about that. Well, that's a great, um, a great point, Polly, and differentiating between, uh, between power and leadership. Uh, and it, it's quite difficult to entangle one from the other, particularly in our kind of traditional Western view of leadership, which is, which is one of control and power. And we tend to we tend to put leaders um, in, into into positions uh, and, and 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 give them give them great power. So um, leadership needs to go in a different direction. I think here um, I think I'd recognise um, Simon Weston's view about the the, the eco leader again, and the 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 the, 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 the eco leader uh, is 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 the type of leader that um, wants to encourage leadership in everybody, self-leadership, um, and, and to give 
and to give away power. So Simon Weston's um, eco leader is 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 a leader that 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 purposefully um, leads by giving away power rather than uh, try, trying to hang on to it or gain more and more. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 I think on a small scale, we have to ask ourselves as people, let's, let's start with ourselves. Um, what is our attitude to, to, to power? You know, um, is, it, is it something, are we, are, we, are we centered in empowering others, really? Um, or do we find ourselves when, we, when we're in a leadership um, position and have leadership responsibility of, of trying to hang on to power and, and, and celebrating um, and glorying in, 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 in the power that we, that, that, that we, that we, that, that we have. I, I think it, for many that is counterintuitive, uh, but I, I think it is, it's, it's back to this idea of, um, of a more dialogic leadership is, 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 to, is to give more power away. Okay, yeah. it reminds me of the, uh, the old business adage, if you can't change the people, change the people. And, uh, you know, one of the, one of the things uh, for me in terms of power and leadership is I think all of this will unfold in the next 25 years as the next batch of future leaders come through and, and the teaching they've had, the lessons they've learned, the way they've moved around in business. It reminds me of uh, an old book. Uh, by, written by Tom Peters, an American businessman. It says, leadership by walking about, actually being immersed in the organization you're in, you know, and, uh, and talking to people and interacting and connecting with people. I think we've got a generation before, hopefully, uh, Paul's dystopian idea of revolution might be staved off if, uh, <laughs> if the next batch of generational leaders are taking a slightly different uh, viewpoint. Sorry, I've been... Yep, <laughs> Uh, there was somebody else who wanted to say something. Peter. Yeah, you've teed up my question beautifully, Andres. I've been struggling with this. Um, and, and my observation, which I think has been a surprise to us all, is that um, one of the impacts of the, of the pandemic has been basically to shut down civil aviation and particularly business travel, which, of course, in emission terms is fantastic. You know, massive amount of carbon emissions gone. But and, and I'm also looking at the top row of my mosaic, which is all gentlemen of a certain age with some few grey hairs in there. Um, in my day, <laughs> um, you did the business on the phone or by telex or by fax, and, and, and then you had email, and you could do the hard commercial stuff. But actually, the way that you did the, the, the real sort of business relations stuff was to meet people. And of course, being based in London, everybody would love to come to London and you'd always make sure they had a day in their programme that you could take them to a traditional pub or maybe Lords or a bit of shopping in the West End. And I mean, I had a fantastic time going around and meeting all sorts of people. Um, and, and my question, I managed to narrow it down to a question to, to the people who are educating the business leaders of the future. Um, do the young people need to do that? I mean, do they, because so much communication now is electronic, I mean, is it, is it necessary to, you know, people get that soft communication by other means? So, can, you know, could we get away with not flying around the world in great polluting yeah. turbine engine, you know, carbon emissions? I think that's a really good question, Peter. And I, I, was, I was just wondering whether we've got people present uh, tonight who... Who don't have uh, who don't have grey beards? <laughs> 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 who who can who can who, who can answer that question? People people who are uh, I, I mean I'm uh, I'm coming up to to to, to, to fifty eight. Yeah, you know, can can can, can 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 we throw that open, Andreas, to to anybody present uh, who's um, who's 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 nearer to to to, to, to twenty eight or eighteen than than than, than, yeah. than fifty eight. There's not many of us on this call, unfortunately, but uh, you know, if anybody wants to be classified to 18 to 28, please raise your hand and make a comment. I'd be really um, interested to Elizabeth, hear about from, from Elizabeth. Is Elizabeth still out there? Yeah. I'm here, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
I can see that you're not 58, Elizabeth. So, so, <laughs> so I'd, I'd really like to hear from you and your a little way away. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, with regards, because that was a, a very interesting um, comment that I would have liked to comment on anyway, actually, uh, regardless of my qualifications. But I mean, it, it actually, I wonder if there's an inherent danger in the fact that we are able to kind of communicate across these vast sort of expanses and sort of, you know, different um, barriers. And so, uh, you know, on the one hand, oh, of course, it's wonderful that we can talk to someone on the other side of the world who we share interests with and learn from them. And that's great. But on the other hand, <laughs> it's enabling us or it could possibly enable us to fracture into little groups um, who all think very much the same and not get to know people who, you know, who in a workplace 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago would have had a very different background, um, you know, very different set of ideals, but we would get to know as a human being and learn that actually, you know, this conservative or this left winger or this single mother or this, you know, person of another race is okay. I think perhaps I worry that the internet will enable us, you know, to confirm our biases in a way that we were never able to before. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I, well, I think that's 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 a, that's a good comment. I mean, there's lots of echo chambers going on online, you know, and uh, you hear what you want to hear. Uh, right, I think we can. Also, also, very reassuring for the. Oh, Peter, I think you're freezing at the moment. Peter, you're back. <clears throat> no, Peter, Peter has gone. Uh, anybody else for anything else? Because we're coming up to nine o'clock now. I'm just sure the civil aviation maybe, industry. Maybe oh. just a, a comment on, on that. When you when you talk to the people who are making the excellent video conferencing facilities uh, <clears throat> now for business, and they're really advanced uh, nowadays, they, they do recommend that groups that are working together, certainly, and there's more groups working together internationally, do meet two or three times a year face to face. Yeah. So that face to face still seems very important. And this is for young people who are working in uh, technical skills, software writing, etc, which all can be done electronically, but they still recommend for those groups to meet, I think, two or three times a year face to face yeah. uh, somewhere, whether it's in London or wherever. Yeah. So those face to face Still, still seem very important. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, we found out in COVID in the last ten months, personal contact, you know, and uh, is is vastly, mass massively important. And also in business meetings. I mean, you, I can't see the whites of people's eyes on this call, and uh, you can't really read the body language in the same way. If if I'm in the business meeting and I see people shuffling around when I say something, I know that they're probably not uh, uh, going to agree with what I'm proposing. And so, such like you can hide so many things in 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 Zoom. Zoom. And I think there's a whole new dress code on Zoom now. It's only the, the top part of you that counts. And uh, <laughs> the rest is immaterial. So I think, you know, there is something about uh, uh, actually being in person and relating to other people. Now, listen, we are running out of time. So I think we need to call it a day. But once again, Paul, thank you very much for a very interesting and thought provoking lecture. Thank you very much indeed. And we'll give you another round of applause. Can I just sort of say that it's it's been a pleasure to uh, to spend the evening with you and and um, and to have this opportunity to meet uh, many of you for the first time and uh, really no really enjoyed it thank you Paul thank you very much. Uh, before you go before you go I just want to give you a heads up in terms of what's happening with the uh, BLSI business and economics uh, series uh, for the first few months of next year. Um, so in January, we've got uh, Dr. Pa Martin Parker from Bristol University giving a talk on. Um, business and the organization after COVID. So that should be quite interesting. Uh, that's in January. In February, we have got Roberta uh, giving a talk on the importance of, of AI in business. And then the third one is, is by Veronica Hope Haley from the University of Bath, and it's about COVID uh, and responsible and trusted business. So those are the three things lined up for January, uh, February, March. If you want to find out more about it, just go to the BLSI website. So as I always say at this juncture, stay safe, stay healthy, 
and most importantly of all, stay sane. See you next time and have a great Christmas. Bye bye. Thanks so much, Paul. That was wonderful. Thank you for hosting. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.